From our studios in beautiful Mandan, North Dakota, along the mighty Missouri River, here is your guru of geek, Marlo Anderson. Jim, I'm still writing notes. Hang on a second. Oh, okay, no. okay, okay. <laughs> so what will that new chip in your credit card mean to you? There's a new chip that's coming out that'll a be new, in our oh, credit cards. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, technology and business, uh, mm. Airbnb and Tesla. And we're also going to be talking about a glucose meter today. So all kinds of cool like stuff. Like if you're a diabetic? Yes, you exactly. Ah, exactly. Okay. So yeah, we're going to be talking to somebody about that in a little bit. So yeah, great show today on the Tech Ranch. We're also attempting to stream on Meerkat again. The key word is tempt, attempting here. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I think hopefully. we need more salt palmetto in the system. Maybe so. Yeah. So actually, using our that's I a created, prostate joke. <laughs> I created because the streaming is you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. At the control panel, producer extraordinaire Jim Walsh. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, enjoy our wonderful wacky weather over the week. Oh weekend. yeah, it's wonderfully wacky. I got to open up the windows, get some cool air blowing in. Finally. It was cool. Yeah. And it was warm. I loved it. I wasn't sweating up a storm as I usually do in the warm weather. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the uh, earlier in the week, it was a little warmer, I guess. Yeah. But the uh, uh, did you have electricity on Saturday? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? Was there an outage? Oh, yeah. We, had, oh. Our, we were out of electricity for quite a while. In fact, I was expecting that we will probably be busy at the shop today because it was one of those that Oh. Electricity on, electricity off, electricity yeah. on, galloping wires someplace. And on and off. And it did that six uh, times yeah. in about 15 seconds, and then it went off totally. So it didn't even give you time to even get things unplugged or whatever. They were just hey. going on and off. So not good on electronics, that's for sure. Bummer. So, so yeah, and, and what that does is, you know, your power supplies in your electronics, you know, whether it's your freezer or your computer. Yeah. It's just tough on them getting those shocks of electricity. I mean, that's basically, and, and if they're not metered, meaning that if you have, or if you don't have like an uninterruptible power supply on them, a lot of times it's not 110 or 120 volts coming through there. It's a few hundred volt or a few hundred at a time because it's not really regulated. So it'll really, uh, six months from now when your freezer goes out, you can probably relate back to uh, Saturday for that. So. And all the clock radios and uh, yes. DVRs are going 12 they're, o'clock, they're, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. That's right, that's right, that's right, exactly. So anyway, uh, we'll get right into it. We have uh, Rob Liano uh, on the phone. Mm. He's the National Sales Director at H or AHCP. We're bowing at you right now, Rob. Yes. So he's also a best-selling author, and he's on to talk about technology and small business. So how are you doing, Rob? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, we're excited to have you on the show as well. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the latest book you have out? Well, actually, I self-published a motivational book um, called Pick Me Up When You Feel Down, because... It's common knowledge, I guess, in a lot of success circles and stuff that people have mentioned with a lot of attraction. What you feed into your mind is what comes out, just like a computer. There's a phrase called Geigo, garbage in, garbage out. The only thing a computer can put out is what comes out. Sure. And what goes in, I'm sorry. And our mind is the same way. So it's interesting because I was listening on hold. A lot of bad news out there, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I don't listen to the news that often. It was really interesting to hear one after the other, and I was like, that is the opposite of my book. <laughs> so yeah, and, if, anyone, if anyone needs a quick pick-me-up, pick up the book. It's there you um, go. over 1,400 quotes, four per day for an entire year. About a dozen are my own, but I literally went through about 6,000 to choose ones that were uncommon, that will make you think and resonate with you and hopefully inspire you to go beyond what we unfortunately learn as limitations and negativity and stuff like that. So, so I appreciate you asking. So where do we pick up your book? Amazon.com would be the best place. It's pick me up when you feel down. Rob Liano is like piano with an L. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. throw a link on the uh, Tech Ranch as well for that. So if people want to go check it out, that'd be great. So that's not the reason you're on, though. You actually uh, are here to talk a little bit about uh, the technologies that are available for business. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's actually twofold. It could either be for if you are, well, everyone is almost selling, depending on what it is. But if you're selling yourself, as in you have a coaching business or a product that you want to deliver online, let's say you do sales training, for instance, there are separate technology for that as opposed to if, say, you were a salesperson in an office trying to promote a product. 
based on your market, which one do you think we should target or both? It's entirely up to you. Um, you, you go for it. I'm really interested in, in follow up and I know you know a little bit about that. So why don't you, why don't, why don't we work yeah. on that side of it? Excellent. I appreciate that. So there's a couple of components that I think are really critical in sales in general, because I'm basically known as a sales strategist. And I got, I did get to co-author a book with Brian Tracy, who is a renowned sales guru. And I've been in sales almost 30 years at this point. I almost hate to say it because it reveals my age to an extent. <laughs> Not including a lemonade stand. So, but I have really been able to pioneer some stuff and witness some stuff that works with the most successful salespeople. Sure. And that, of course, follow up is key, as as is the initial phone call. In a lot of sales realms, most sales are closed on call one and two. The least percentage wise are closed on sale on call three, four, five, and six, where you're kind of chasing the client down. Of course, it depends on if you're in a really six-figure type of sale where you have to nurture that relationship a little bit more. But things like insurance sales, um, cell phone sales, things of that nature, it's basically you you have one shot when that striking wild iron is hot. So if you are doing telephonic sales, especially a couple of the components that I think are critical are web sharing, which allows you to have your client view your computer creating somewhat of a face-to-face environment. But for me, the best component of web sharing is it will absolutely eliminate the can you send me some information objection, that people call it objection, that so many people get stuck on and say, sure, what's your email, and their wind is knocked out of their sales, F-A-L-E-S. And web sharing will allow you to say, sure, what would you like to see? And you log them into a web share, they can see your computer. It will make them feel more inclined to do business with you because it will allow them to trust you. Sure. Because they know that you're not sitting at home in your underwear in your basement or your mom's basement or whatever extreme example you want to use. Well, it's okay. Jim Jim and I are sitting in our underwear right now. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so for me, it legitimizes the sale and will allow someone to say, oh, okay, great, so I can make this decision. I'm not handing over my credit card to some stranger. And that depends on the sales position you're in. A lot of times... Uh, you could use a dialer as well. If you have a lot of clients to potentially call, you can have a phone that dials for you. Um, they have click to call now on the internet, which you can use to a search click to call. Where if you're running, doing research on potential contacts, like a friend of mine now has this moving software, and he wants me to help position him to offer that. And I told him to get all those guys on click to call, meaning they could look up. A moving company, click the number and it calls you. All right, Rob, why don't, you. why don't you throw it real quick where we can find more information because we're against the clock here. Okay, um, just have anyone email me, rob at robliano.com, because they might have other questions about other technology, including a CRM that will automatically send pre-written emails out. Okay, and I'll, th- I'll throw that on the website and we'll be yeah. right back, everybody. Right now, 55. Get the app called Radio Pup for your iPhone and take us everywhere you go. Bismarck and Mandan's own Super Talk 1270. Follow the Guru of Geek at Facebook.com backslash the Tech Ranch or Twitter at Guru of Geek or the Tech Ranch.com. Here again is your Guru of Geek, Marlo Anderson. As we're dancing in the station here, so we want to welcome all of our listeners across the country and around the world on the Blueberry Network, on the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Of course, we're on iTunes, tuned in, Roku, and our own app, Radio Pup. We're all over the place. And uh, uh, shortly, we're going to be talking to to uh, Todd Derniak. He has an amazing new device to monitor diabetes. So if you have a friend or that or a family member that has this issue with diabetes or, or uh, whoever, or yourself even, you want to stay tuned for that. Jim, you had an update now on the drone situation in North Dakota. and Right. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that story? Well, as I understand it, we read the story this morning on all of our stations okay. here at the uh, Town Square Media uh, office for Bismarck. Uh, the story is that the uh, FAA, the major regulatory group that handles stuff in the yep. air yep. flying around, uh, they have approved uh, a format where the drones will be allowed to go as high as 1,200 feet any time, day or night, when they're testing them in the entire state of North Dakota. Wow. 
Now, we had a call after I read that story. I had a call from a local gentleman. Apparently, he was a pilot. Okay. Who said that he called the FAA and the guy on the phone with him knew nothing about it. Okay. So, to follow up, I called the Associated Press, who are the press people who uh, distribute the stories. Right. And the guy confirmed over the phone. He said, well, I can confirm that, uh, yeah, this, this is legit. That and, the FAA announced that they haven't put it in place yet, but they announced that they're going to. Well, and, and, and just on the FAA side of their too, there, there are many departments, of course, in right. the FAA. And the yeah, person it's a bureaucracy. That you, yeah, you and know. the person you talk to may not have anything to do with drones or just didn't know about the new yeah. you know, rig. And uh, just so that everybody knows, I mean, North Dakota, for the most part, is a test area yeah. for drones. And uh, it is it is interesting, though, that at 1,200 feet, you know, the the current level is four 400 right. feet and uh, now i'm not sure if this new ruling will impact hobbyists like myself for flying drones if we're able to take them up to 1200 feet too or if you have to have a special exemption from the faa so we'll follow up with this a little bit uh, we'll yeah. may, maybe next week we'll get some of the some of the people we know from uh, und on with us and By clarify yeah. what this all means because this is this has substantial impact actually uh being able to go up to that extra 800 feet so all right and then on the phone with us uh mr todd derniak todd how you doing i'm doing just fine today thanks for uh thanks for having me yeah thanks for hanging on there we just need to get that little bit of news out there so um so you have a new device for diabetes monitoring so i'm just going to kind of Turn it over to you, Todd, and explain to us exactly sure. what you guys are, are developing. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm with Lab Style Innovations, and we make the Dario Diabetes Management Platform. Now, this platform is, is quite unique. It's, uh, it's a miniature meter, and it's powered directly by the smartphone, so the meter itself doesn't have a battery in it, but it uses the smartphone to do all the uh, measurement activities that you would have to do when you're using uh, when you're using test strips to manage your blood glucose levels. So how how does that work exactly? Well, the uh, the meter uh, itself is a tiny little dongle that slips into the audio jack, and it uses the power of the audio jack to connect to a reagent strip that you attach a 0.3 nanoliter drop of blood, which you take with a lancet on your finger touch that strip in, the chemistry happens outside the phone, the phone displays the blood glucose level, and it also syncs it directly to the cloud, so you've now digitized your result. So this this is really, this is very interesting, by the way. So people who might be familiar with like a square or a PayPal Now device on a smartphone, like when you go buy something at a flea market or something, those attach, uh, there's not a special attachment on the phone per se, it just goes right into the audio jack. So you're doing the same thing here. It's exactly, it looks very much like a square type device. It's a, it's a little bit smaller. And it allows us to support both the iOS and Android platforms. And we're, we get around the uh, connector issue uh, for any sort of phone by using the audio jack as a standard. So are you sending information through the audio jack as well, or is there uh, some type of, of uh, wireless connection that's going on there? There's no Bluetooth or wireless, and, and it just sends a voltage signal in, which the application which you load on your phone uses to uh, display the, the uh, accurate result of your blood glucose testing. That's absolutely amazing. So how are things progressing with this? Well, we don't have approval yet in the U.S. We filed with the FDA, and we expect that uh, before the end of the year. But we are CE marked in Europe, so we're selling in Europe. We got Canadian approval in in March, so we're we're selling uh, very well in Canada, and we're also doing very well in Australia, where, where we are reimbursed by that company country as well. And, and anybody who's maybe just joining in, we're talking about a diabetes monitoring tool that you utilize with your smart device. And for more information, go to mydario.com. It's M-Y-D-A-R-I-O.com. And I will have a link to this off the Tech Ranch website as well. So, so Todd, you know, what are the advantages of being able to put your, your information on the cloud? Well, for instance, let's say you're a type 1 person with diabetes and you're a kid at school and you're testing your blood sugar after lunch. 
by the fact that you put it on your phone, it goes to the cloud. You could generate a message to the school nurse or your mother at home saying that you've done your test and your, uh, your value is X. And, and that way you can have a, uh, a link to your caregiver network. Also, if you were a, a, a hospital system or a payer system and you wanted to manage a large population of diabetics and look at all their data, every single test goes on the cloud. And then you could create a dashboard to see how people are doing with their testing regimen and how they're controlling their blood sugar. And, and basically, that's a good indicator for how they're controlling their health. That is uh, uh, very cool. And, and, and of course, uh, you know, if you're looking at, I'm just trying to think of the best way to say this, but let's say you, you want history. So, you know, and your doctor wants history. So maybe you can, you know, a year or two from now, your doctor yourself can actually refer back to what was happening in August of 2015. So you can see if things are progressing as they should, are things getting worse? And of course you have those statistics or that data from every day. So I, I think that's an amazing accomplishment. Yes, it, it really automates what used to be a, a log book. Now there are a lot of different meters on the market. Some sync with Bluetooth, some connect with cables you can upload and download. But this really simplifies it and requires you to put that data online. And it also comes, you know, along with a website. So after you do your test, if you want to open up your own personal web page, those test results then get synced directly and, you know, in a very short period of time show up right on your screen. So you've recorded that. So when you sit in with your doctor's office, you have all those results to discuss in very high resolution. It's almost like a high-resolution view of your disease before you had low res and now you have high res. So is this something that you think most insurance companies will pick up the cost or is it a relatively low cost item? It's a relatively low cost item. I don't think it, you know, one of the neat things about this is it really doesn't add any cost over and above what people are already paying for, for their supplies and for their meters. It's, it's very affordable. And we're just utilizing smartphone technology to, uh, to really take it to the next level. So, uh, so it's not an additional, really a large additional expense to any healthcare systems or, or, or you know, the end user. And, and, of course, the ability to, you know, do away with that logbook, which, you know, and this is the thing with a logbook or any other type of metering, in my, in my opinion, is that it's, it's difficult to compile results quickly. You know, if you want to look back from what happened a year or two ago, you know, if everything's written down somewhere or if you have it in a database or whatever, however you're keeping track, it's just difficult to do that. This app or the app or whatever you want to call it, the, the cloud storage that you have, does this for you. And, and it's just an amazing thing. It really is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the users actually that are using it right now love the gamification they get from managing their disease. There's a little wheel on the front of the app that shows you how you're doing in range, whether you're 30% in range, 40%, 50%, 90%. And folks get really excited when they start getting in that 90% range. So that instant feedback of how they're doing over the last seven days, over the last 30 days, over the last 90 days, in that one glance, really keeps people engaged in their, uh, in their testing regimen. So are you thinking that people actually test like they should because of this, you know, because I know a few people in diabetes and, and they tend not to test as often as they should. Well, and, and I think that it, because it reminds you, it gives you a notification on your phone, not on a meter or anything else. You're sitting there and you're looking at your phone and a message comes up, by the way, you haven't tested your blood sugar, boom, right on your screen. Gotcha. That, that gives you a little bit, oh, I should test this. Sure. And, uh, you know, the fact that we package it in a kind of a cool little all-in-one device that, uh, that allows people to carry all their supplies in, in, a, in a tiny little uh, package is also a plus for users. It's a little bit more discreet and a little cooler looking uh, than most. Yeah, I think this is a very, very cool deal. So, again, how do we find you, Todd? Uh, www.mydario.com. Again, for our U.S. listeners, we are not yet approved in the U.S., but, uh, but we are doing business overseas, and uh, we look forward to... Uh, to moving forward in the, that U.S. and other markets. Do you have a time frame, maybe? Um, you know, we're looking at uh, you know we're looking at before the end of the year. Okay, kind of our uh, trajectory. Fantastic. That's what we're hoping. All right, we appreciate it, Todd. Thanks for being on again, everybody. Go to mydario.com. I will have that link. 
uh, for you as well. And after the break, everybody, we will be joined by Miss Metaverse, Katie Aquino. We're going to be talking about why you want to be aware of the new chip that's coming out in your credit card. So come on back. Right now, 55. You're never more than a few minutes from a weather update. Here on Super Talk 1270. We're back to the Tech Ranch. Stream this program now at supertalk1270.com. Here is your guru of geek, Marlo Anderson. So, of course, we've had the fraud issues in the past with having chips and cards. People could actually walk behind you or, or there's a special wand that you could use, Jim, that you could walk behind somebody who had a billfold in their back pocket Whoa. or or uh, in your purse, or whatever, and you could wand over it, and it would give you the information off the credit card. Holy mother. And girl. they sent out hundreds of millions of these cards and found out that there, that this could be circumvented. And the, the positive side of them is they were convenient. You could be within, uh, I think it was like 20 to 25 inches of like the terminal. Okay. And you could just basically wave your card over the terminal mm-hmm. And you won't have to swipe it through a magnetic strip because I'm sure you've had this experience before where, where they're trying to swipe the magnetic part of the card and it's not working right. and you can't get the, the transaction to go through or whatever. That took care of that, but it was so easy to steal the information. So then the credit card companies decided to pull this back because it was so easy for P, uh, the criminals to get this information. And now they're coming out with... Actually, it's not new technology, but it's called EMV. It's called the EMV chip. And the EMV stands for Euro... MasterCard Visa. So it's those three formats of payment that you can utilize. And they claim that this is going to be a much better scenario. So with that, I'm bringing into the conversation Miss Metaverse, Katie Aquino. How are you doing, Katie? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Marlo? I'm doing fine as well. So have you been following this at all? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, when, when it was funny because I remember being in Germany back in, I think it was 2007, and my friends talking about the differences between our credit cards and their credit cards, and I remember seeing that their credit cards over there had this tiny little microchip-looking thing on it, and I thought that was interesting because they didn't have the magnetic stripe that we have on our cards. Right. So I was like, well, how does that work? And then that was the first time I, I kind of saw that you know technology in use, and I was I was wondering when it was going to come over to the U.S., but it has been quite a while. And now it seems that this technology is coming here, and we are all going to be using it very, very, very soon. Uh, It appears that it's going to help cut down on all the credit card fraud that we're having now, so that should be good. Right. So they expect that they'll ship out approximately 575 uh, chip cards uh, by the end of 2015. So if you don't have yours yet, you're going to be getting it pretty soon. And of course, the merchants themselves have to be compliant with this as well. So they have to put in new equipment uh, to read this. Now, they will have your your first card that will be coming will have both. You'll have a magnetic strip and you'll have the chip on it. But in, sometime in the future, you won't have the magnetic strip at all. Right, exactly. So yeah, the first kinds, the first cards we are going to have will still have the magnetic strip, but they're going to have both technologies. The thing is, the difference is, is that there are going to be new penalties in place uh, for those companies who do not adopt the new uh, EMV chip cards by, I believe it's October 1st of this year. Now, the difference is because now credit card companies who uh, do not have these chip cards, um, because the technology is here, because it is being put in place, those uh, companies that are still, that do not convert to um, having the chips on the cards and do have uh, these fraudulent activities on them, um, they will have to be dealt with differently because it's almost like saying, all right, we have the new technology, you didn't use it, now you have to pay for it. And that's kind of why all the companies are like, all right, we're going to all switch to the EMV chip cards, um, and it's going to be different. It's going to be a little different. But like you said, Marlo, we're all sick of you know getting our cards in the mail, and maybe two weeks later, if you know, we go on vacation, we're using the card a lot, we wear down the strip on the back of the card and then we can't use it. And that's frustrating. So this will be good. So when it works, now I haven't seen one of these actually work yet. So when you were in Germany, I mean, is this something that you lay the card down on the terminal or is there a swipe that goes on or how does that work? Well, unlike the mag strips where you have to, you know, have that perfect swipe rate action, these cards, the chip cards, you can, you can kind of dip it. They call it dipping. So you dip the, 
you know, either your, the, the card into the terminal or you can, uh, some of them have the near field communication technology. So basically, like you were saying before, you know, you could be a short, short distance without having to actually physically put the card onto the terminal. It depends on which uh, chips or which technologies it has. But I believe that, um, you know, it won't be the same. You won't have to just swipe it through the actual machine. You could just dip it close so it can scan it and, and uh, then you go on. So is the possibility of somebody stealing your credit card information going to increase a little bit because of these chips, or do you think it's actually going to go the other way? Well, the reason why they're all doing this is because they're saying it's going to be a lot more difficult. The problem with today and the way that people have these uh, these problems with their credit card numbers being stolen is because we're all online, we're all making purchases online, but not only that, when we go away, there's a huge epidemic right now of people during the summer who complained about going away on vacation. And even at popular hotels, workers at these hotels were taking the credit card information and using it to make their own purchases online or uh, charging more than they should so they could pocket that money. Now, that's scary. But that won't be possible anymore with these new cards. Because everything's because these- encrypted off the chip, correct? Exactly. And the the pins, you know, the numbers associated with it will continuously keep on changing, just like as if you were to have not just one password, but you have multiple passwords that keep on changing. That's why this is very beneficial. So what about like online transit, you know, transactions? I mean, is there still a number across the face of the card that you can utilize to type in someplace or not? It seems that, the, yes, these first ones will be like that. That's that's what I've read so far. The first ones that we start getting were going to be very much like that. I think they're just kind of testing the waters right now, um, you know, so to be able to prevent, you know, maybe making duplicate cards or, or whatnot uh, and also stealing it the same way, I think that there will be more um, ways. But I am interested. I'm not really sure exactly how that will work as is, you know, because most of our orders, a lot of our orders that we do are online, right? right. So Well, you, you and me we'll especially. have to have that same number. You know, and I would imagine a lot of people are, are becoming more and more used to buying things online. The convenience of having it just delivered right to your place, you know, is just wonderful. So I, I guess what I'm thinking here is that, you know, in, in the past, especially Discover Card for a while there, you could go in and you, you could get a unique number assigned to you to do a one-off uh, credit card transaction online. So they give you one unique number that could never be used again. I wonder if all of our credit card companies are going to start utilizing that then. So you log into your account, you get a one-off to uh, buy something online, and that's it. That that would actually probably be a really good thing, to be honest, because that's the biggest problem is that we all get our data stored on the websites that we use, and, and there continues to be these big hacking scandals and problems where people's credit cards are being, uh, their numbers are being taken. So if they're continuously changing, that's a great idea. I'm, yeah. I'm all for it. Yeah, I am too. You know, I, I've been the victim of this particular scenario many times and not so much that I'm concerned about what I do on my side because I, 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 rel- I keep myself relatively secure, but I just don't know what the other company is doing. And then, you know, tomorrow you find out about another hack that goes on and not to pick on Target. And it really wasn't that Target's fault, although they got the blame for it, so to speak. But you know they, uh, um, you know it's a software that they use, and there's there's hidden backdoors and things that have been around forever, and these things get exploited 15 years later. You know, just waiting for the perfect time, and you just never know what's going to happen in 2018 or 2020. So, the ability to change these numbers all the time is a game changer. Definitely. So, yep, um, yeah. So, have you got one yet? I haven't yet, and okay. I'm kind of surprised about that because I actually just recently got a new card because guess what happened? <laughs> My number was taken, and I had all these strange charges from some uh, random thing. I thank goodness I looked into it, and I was checking because I do. I check I check my accounts often because you have to. You It's so easy for people to take your numbers nowadays, and I think, you know, uh, the faster we could start implementing this, and like you said, Marlo, having that technology to have a unique credit card number for each transaction you have and being able to do that will be great. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, 575 million chip cards by the end of 2015. So uh, there's only five months left of the year. So I'm thinking that they kind of have to get busy on this pretty shortly. Yeah. So keep your eyes peeled for your mailboxes. Yeah. You're going to get all new cards. (laughs) Yeah. Anybody who doesn't get mail anymore, all of a sudden you're going to start getting some again here. So yeah, very, 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 very cool. So look out for this, the EMV card. And uh, let's just hope 
that the criminals out there don't figure out a way to circumvent this chip. I'm just, you know, I, I, uh, I don't mean to be pessimistic because I'm not generally a pessimistic person, but it seems like every time there's a new technology inv- invented for credit cards or utilized for credit cards, somebody figures out a way to scam it. Right. <laughs> so let's hope that's not the case with this. So, all right. Um, oh, let's move into, wait, we got to, Wow, I was going to give this this topic the whole segment here, Jim, and no. here we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Katie and I get through stuff really, really quick. So. Two minute warning. All right. So why don't you tell everybody? Because I know that this particular topic that we're about to talk about is not very popular in our area. So why don't you explain what Airbnb is? Oh, Airbnb. Well, it's a new platform. It's it's a new way of booking your travel that's going to be way different. You can find apartments and rooms for rent. You can go anywhere all over the world instead of having to rely on just a hotel room. You can find real people who are renting their actual homes, or you can even rent a room in their home from all over the world. So there's a lot of good benefits to this. And people leave reviews, which is great because you can review a house that you stayed at or a family that you stayed with. And I think this is great. It's uniting the whole world. Imagine right now you say, I want to go on an adventure. You can go on Airbnb, find a family in Spain, go over to Madrid, meet another culture, be immersed in that culture, and go be able to tell all these stories and make new friends. I think it's great. Yeah, I think it is cool too. And the the one thing that I like about this is that uh, and, and, I, and I know you're probably not used to this, but in our neck of the woods, we have a lot of small towns that don't have hotels in those towns. You know, they're a population of 200 or 500 or whatever. Uh, a person can actually put a rental up, uh, use an Airbnb, and actually uh, drive income and, and provide a service to the community. So after the break, everybody, we'll continue our discussion on Airbnb and the newest innovations in 3D printing. So come on back. Right now, 63. Get the traffic and weather information you need anytime on Super Talk 1270 and online at supertalk1270.com. Follow the guru of geek everywhere he goes. Post your comments or questions at thetechranch.com. Once again, your guru of geek, Marlo, Marlo Anderson. Anderson. Welcome back to the Tech Ranch, everybody. We are appreciative that you are here. We're talking about Airbnb. Uh, many of you probably are not familiar with this. B&B is actually short for bed and breakfast, of course. And this is a new way that a person can actually make a couple dollars at your house or maybe you got an extra property laying around or whatever and want to make a couple extra dollars with it. And this is a great way to do that. So anyway, Katie, um, have you ever stayed at an Airbnb property before? I have not, but I, I my aunt Lori is actually visiting me right now from North Carolina, and she told me all about Airbnb, her experiences. Uh, you know, my cousins they stayed uh, in, in actually in Spain and I believe uh, Prague. Oh, Italy, yes, Italy, and they said they had a great time. They said that they had such a great time. It's clean. You know, you can find beautiful, beautiful places to go stay at. Uh, they went to Charleston. And they stayed in a beautiful house there. And even when I uh, used the website myself, I did actually look, though, for a place. And I, I've been thinking about doing a rental because they have beautiful places here on Long Island where you can rent a home right on the beach for $200 a night, which is amazing. So generally speaking, you can find places that are probably a little less than the going rate, correct? But, you know, in the area and you get to probably have a better stay because you have more room. uh, It's it's more private. All of that kind of comes into play. Absolutely. You don't have trains going by. It depends. There's everything from like a full house you can rent or you can rent just a room at somebody's house. It it varies. But I'd say the price points are very, 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 very affordable. I mean, even here in Long Island, just a hotel room at a really, really – uh, kind of scary motel here on Long Island starts at probably two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars. Right here in Airbnb, you can rent a whole house for two hundred to three hundred dollars, and it's beautiful. It's got a pool. It looks like a hotel. You can't even tell the difference. And what's cool about this is, and, and I'm hoping that I'm giving some people some ideas here, is that you're able to actually go on to Airbnb and rent out space. So, for example, if I wanted to rent out the downstairs of my four-level house, for example, 
Uh, don't spend a lot of time down there, but we have a guest room down there. We have a little living room down there, uh, extra bathroom down there. I mean, all this, it could really be an apartment down there, and I could actually start generating income with this, couldn't I? You definitely could, and that's something to definitely look into if that's something that you're interested in and you have that space. You can make a, a really good amount of money doing this, and I definitely recommend uh, trying it. It seems very safe. It seems like uh, there's a lot of things in place uh, to protect against any kind of, um, you know, unwanted experiences, but it is. It's, it's a very good thing. Um, it's definitely something to look into. And, of course, Airbnb also handles the monetary side of that, too. So so you put up, let's say you wanted to get $100 a night uh, for your for your space. You put that up there. Airbnb will take their percentage out of that, but at the end, uh, they'll send you money, I would imagine, via PayPal or what have you. I believe so. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but I, I do think it would be something like that, right? I would imagine a person could have a direct deposit into your account. There's probably a few different ways. Most of those type of platforms have that. But, yeah, it's very, very popular and gaining a lot of traction. And what's unique about this, not to get into the Tesla talk a little bit, but uh, why don't you explain to everybody what a Tesla is, and I'm going to talk about the correlation between Airbnb and Tesla. Oh, Tesla, the company. Yes. Tesla. Or the car. The Tesla car. Yes. Yes. The Tesla car is uh, an electric car. It's an electric car that uh, was made by Tesla Motors. And it's uh, very, very innovative because there's a lot of great features on it. You could control a lot of things through the smartphone app on your phone. So it's, uh, you know, a Elon Musk company that uh, makes these amazing cars. Definitely check them out. If you've never heard of the Tesla car, definitely look into it. But, yeah, tell me. Tell me how does this relate to Airbnb. I'm, I, I'm curious. I knew you would love this. So, okay. So if, uh, if you have a Tesla and, well, okay. So you're, you're an Airbnb property and you want to recruit people who own Teslas, you can do that. You can get a hold of Tesla. And if you have a rating of between four and five on your property, you can actually become a recharging station for Teslas. Wow. <laughs> so they're going to mirror or you know mirror the two or partner the two different entities here so and Tesla will send the equipment out to you i believe there's a $1000 setup charge for your property to do this uh and i think that's the labor but the uh Tesla will send the equipment out to you and after that uh you can recruit these people who are driving their Teslas around so they can charge off of uh when they when they show up you know so and and that's part of Tesla's big uh, thing right now is trying to get more and more public places and semi-private places to have charging stations for Teslas. You know, so I'm going to guess in the future that you'll be able to roll into, you know, maybe a major franchise restaurant that all of them will have charging stations for the, for Teslas and, and those type of things. So I expect that to be a big deal in the near future as Tesla gains more and more ground. That would be so cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's very interesting. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, for an Airbnb um, property, I guess you could say, you know, people who own Teslas generally, you know, at this time are generally higher income individuals simply because the cars cost, you know, 70 grand on up. Uh, so you're attracting, you know, that type of clientele to your property as well. So, you know, it's kind of a, I see this as kind of a win-win for both. Those type of people probably don't think anything of dropping, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars a night for for a place to stay. You know, so that's that's kind of, I'm sure, what they're looking at here. Now, in the future, I would expect that you're going to start seeing some, you know, as production catches up with Tesla. I think it takes six to nine months to get a car right now. That's how far behind they are. Wow. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty, it's an amazing story. And what's interesting about Tesla, it's the only car that I'm aware of right now that the resale value is higher than what you purchased it for. So you could actually, you know, a person could actually start scalping Teslas if you wanted to instead of uh, tickets for the latest concert coming to your area and make a couple dollars on that. But anyway, uh, just something that I think is interesting what's going on between Airbnb and Tesla. So I know we're running out of time here. Any new things on the horizon for 3D printing? Oh, yes. Yes, there's a lot happening in 3D printing, actually. Okay. I uh, had gone to the Robo Universe event a couple months ago, which is here in New York City, 
And there, I got to see a new 3D printer, which is called Voxel. And what's really interesting about Voxel 3D printers is that they're multi-material printers. They can do more than just, say, plastic filament, like we're very much used to now. A lot of the 3D printers that we see today, you know, by MakerBot or, uh, you know, any of those 3D systems, a lot of them are using this type of plastic filament that gets melted down, and that's where it creates the objects, because it melts down and then gets printed by depositing layer upon layer upon layer of whatever the plastic is, thereby making an actual object. Now, this is all changing, and the future of 3D printing will not likely move away from this, you know, uh, layering type of, uh, of method because it takes a long time. The problem right. with 3D printing now is it takes forever. It takes, you know, a whole day to print something sometimes, yes. right? Yes, yes. So <clears throat> there are some new interesting things. Voxel, the 3D printer, is interesting because it uh, not only prints, let's say, if you want to print a drone, a little miniature drone from your 3D printer, you can print not only the, the plastic parts of the drone, but you could also print circuits inside of the drone. So being able to print circuits and other materials, a multi-material printer is awesome because you're putting everything into one, and that will help streamline the process. Well, and, and you take that, to, you know, I know you're talking about drones, but uh, there's actually work on the horizon for Horizon, I should say, for printing houses. Yeah. And, and oh. yeah, so you'll have this huge platform where you'll print your house but the plumbing gets printed, the electrical gets printed, wow. the windows, or I, I would imagine some type of polymer for your windows. But yeah. all of this stuff gets printed as it's, you know, so in a week or 10 days or whatever, you order a house and this thing comes out and, and uh, starts printing it. And two weeks later, you get to show up and, and uh, live in it. So pretty amazing. It really is. I mean, there was even a 3D printer that was in China that, got a lot of press because it printed, I think, I believe it really printed up to 10 homes in a matter of hours with this thing because it was just layering concrete upon concrete and yep. filling in in between. So it was building the foundation to snap, which is cool. Uh, but other advances in 3D printing happened really recently, and they are very exciting. There's uh, a team at MIT recently developed a way to 3D print glass instead of plastic. So being able to 3D print glass, like you said, will be able to, you could 3D print your shower doors. How cool would that be, right, <laughs> into your house, <laughs> right? Um, but another method, now we were talking before about how the method took a long time, right? Right. I'm going to finish today with this really quick. Okay. Have you heard of the CLIP method? No. Okay, so CLIP stands for Continuous Liquid Interface Production. Okay. And now, this is different because the way the clip method works is that it's almost a big liquid pool. It's not a filament that's, you know, printed out through a cartridge upon layer upon layer. It's different. Clip is a big pool of, uh, like, a liquid resin. And this machine dips continuously into the pool, but it uses this membrane that uh, will actually create dead zones in the pool. So as it keeps on dipping, keeps on dipping, almost like a candle, it'll create layer upon layer upon layer, but it makes the 3D printing process crazy fast, way faster than 3D printing is today. And it's not only doing that, but the type of product that it comes out with at the end is much smoother and not rough like a lot of the objects we end up with today from traditional 3D printers that use this uh, you know, plastic filament and whatnot. Absolutely, and, and I will uh, post uh, links to all this stuff on the TechRanch.com. Katie, a pleasure having you on the show as usual. Jim, great to have you here as well. So until next week, everybody, I guess goodbye.